At the end of the day, martial arts is about a lot of different aspects of life and living and, and discipline, but it's, you know, obviously based on self-defense. Hello, everyone. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 420. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Mr. Rich Tang. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, your host on this show, the founder of Whistlekick. And I'm just a guy who loves the martial arts, so I found a way to spend as much time talking about martial arts as possible. And we do that here on this show twice a week. Mondays, we bring you an interview. Thursdays, we generally bring you a topic-focused show. Sometimes I'm solo. Sometimes I bring on a guest or two. But there's a lot more going on than just this podcast. If you head on over to whistlekick.com, you can see everything we've got going on. All the various projects, all the different websites, and even the things that we make. And if you head into the store, you can use the code PODCAST15 to get yourself 15% off anything in the store. If you want the show notes with transcripts and videos and photos and links and a whole bunch more, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com is the place to go for that. If you're at all a fan of TV or movies, there's a good chance you would recognize today's guest. Mr. Rich Ting has been in quite a few things and a broader set of movies and television than you might imagine of someone that we would have on this show. However, he's also part of a new project, something that we've talked about on this show a bit, and we've even had one guest behind the launch of that project. But this time, we bring you someone from in front of the camera. We have a great chat about his experience with martial arts, his experience being on camera, on set, and how martial artists become actors. Let's welcome him to the show. Mr. Tang, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. How you doing? I'm happy to be on. Hey, I'm doing great. I'm happy to have you on. You know, it, it's not too often I get to have conversations with people who just, honestly, not even a week ago, I was watching a, a television show and watching you do your thing. It doesn't, doesn't happen <laughs> too cool. often with, with, with guests. And, and unfortunately, you know, not every television show even has martial arts, but, you know, our listeners are most likely to know you from doing a little butt kicking. <laughs> so let, let's, we're, we're going to, we're going to get into that. And if, if the name isn't familiar, then, then I'm sure we'll, we'll get there and the listeners will sign off and, 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 you know, go dig into the show. But before we get there, you know, everything we're going to talk about today is, is about martial arts. It's about your story as a martial artist. So let's, Let's roll that tape back. How did you get started mm -hmm. as a martial artist? I mean, I started at the age of four years old, and, and that was the age in which it was the first time I was exposed to Bruce Lee. First time I saw movies like Enter the Dragon, um, The Big Boss, uh, The Chinese Connection, um, Game of Death. And I, I, I remember my parents were watching it at the time, and I just completely was drawn in by this man who I identified with at the age of four, just because he was Asian and me being of mixed Asian descent, I, you know, it wasn't, I never really looked, you know, for, well, let me say this. I never really looked for an Asian role model on the big screen at the age of four years old. But when I saw Bruce Lee moving and doing what he did, um, which inspired so many of us around the world and, I mean, up until the present day, it, it, it affected me. Um, and I remember telling my parents, like, I want to do that. And so right after seeing Bruce for the first time, my parents enrolled me into, into a Taekwondo studio, which actually, at that time, that specific form was called Tang Sudo. And it was in Los Angeles. And that's when I started. And the rest is history. And we can fast forward to 2019 already. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, now I'm curious. So, so you're, you're talking, you're, you're touching on a, an, an element of Bruce Lee and Bruce Lee's impact in the United States that doesn't get a lot of attention. And, and that is the fact that he, he was an, an Asian getting prominent placement, you know, getting movies, totally. getting a lot of things. And, and of course, we had Shannon Leon not too long ago talking about mm -hmm. you know a bit of the whether you call it legend or controversy however you want to look at it the idea that mm -hmm. the show kung fu should have been his but because of prejudice 
It mm-hmm. wasn't right. Totally. So totally. when your parents are exposing you to those movies and, and admittedly there, we may have some parents saying, I, I've, I've watched those movies. I don't want my four-year-old watching those. I suspect mm. that there was some importance that they were placing on those movies and showing them to you. Did they have a connection to martial arts or was it, you know, a cultural element? Were they looking to expose you to a, I guess, a role model? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think, I think the short answer would be that they were not actually looking for a role model for me. I I think the thing that is very unique about my, my personal situation is that my, my mother is third generation Japanese American. So my grandparents, my Japanese grandparents were actually born in the U S and my dad is second generation Chinese American. And he well, they both actually did not grow up speaking any other language in English. Um, there was, they were kind of the breakaway, even though my mom's more Americanized than my dad is. Um, there was, I think they both represented that, that breakaway generation from, you know, from the motherland, the immigrant, and then now assimilating into the U S and mainstream American culture. So, you know, when I came along as a fourth generation, you know, biracial Asian American kid, um, I, I don't think they were trying to find an, a quote unquote Asian role model for me. I, I just think my parents were Bruce Lee fans and happened to have it on. And I saw some, some stuff. I saw the way he moved. I saw just, just, you know, I think at the age of four, you know, you can, you know, I, I try to recall as much as I can, you know, but the one thing that sticks out is I just identified with this guy, you know, I just looked at him and I think it's a great, a great kind of indicator at the time. And, you know, now obviously hopefully those are, those barriers are being broken down. But what I'm referring to are those moments where like, you know, as a kid, you know, back in the eighties, there just was a complete, what's the correct term? There was a complete, just, I mean, not Asian Americans weren't existent, did not exist on camera, you know, let alone Asians especially in the U S on U S television. And so when I saw Bruce, it wasn't like, I was like, I, I look like that guy. It was like, wow, who's this man who is Asian like me? You know, the, 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 the side note is, you know, the way Bruce spoke and obviously his environment that he was in, I was very foreign to me, you know, because I grew up speaking English. I grew up around my parents who have perfect American English accents, obviously, because they're, it is their first language, you know, so when I, you know, when I'd see Bruce in these, these Hong Kong films or these, you know, with other Hong Kong actors and Chinese actors and, and, and he spoke a certain way and, you know, they filmed in Asia, it was very foreign to me overall, but there was just something about him being an Asian leading man, um, which obviously I didn't know that term at the age of four, but there was just something about that, that really captivated me and drew me in. And then obviously, you know, I just think being a four-year-old, uh, uh, male <laughs> kid growing up and seeing another Asian guy literally with this skill and this ability to, um, to, 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 to finish people, I should say, <laughs> I don't want to say, I don't want to say punish people, but to just finish people, you know, and, and just his moves and his use of weapons. It was just, you know, it was so cool to me at the time that it just, I was just naturally drawn to it. Mm. Nice. So you said you started with Tung Soo Do. And, you know, I expect that you, you journeyed from there, but so what did, what did that stage in your martial arts development look like? I mean, it was, you know, it's, it's very foundational, obviously. And that's one thing I'm very grateful that my parents, you know, serendipitously just put me into a Taekwondo, uh, you know, Korean style martial arts in the very beginning. You know, I've, I've been able to venture into other forms of martial arts throughout my entire life. But I, I truly feel having the original foundation, you know, especially at that young age, um, in, take, in Taekwondo, it was probably the best thing for me. You know, just learning the fundamental stances, you know, just moving, um, learning, you know, how to chamber, how to recoil, um, you know, hand placement, foot placement, finger placement, you know. Uh, I, I really, I really owe a lot. To, to the Taekwondo world just because I feel like for me, it prepared me in the best way to, to pursue other martial arts and to obviously do what I'm doing today. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's take a little bit of a sidebar. Let's, you know, kind of 
finish up the circle and then we can go back and we can we can fill in some of the details. What is it you're doing today? <laughs> <laughs> For the, um, for the folks for the folks listening that that may not know, because mm-hmm. I, I know. Um, yeah, no, I I'm I'm very I'm very humbled and blessed to say that I am a Hollywood actor, a a working Hollywood actor. To to add that in, um, it, it's been a fantasy of mine ever since I was a kid. You know, ever since seeing Bruce Lee on on camera, that it kind of planted a seed in my brain at the time that you know I, that would be a I don't say a dream because a dream of mine was to play football in college and to play at a division one level and to be a a division one college athlete. Um, That was the the dream. And and when I say it like that, I mean a realistic dream to me. I I, I excelled in sports as as, as a young kid and throughout high school. and, And that was a realistic dream that I thought I could achieve and actually did achieve. The fantasy is what I call it is when I was a kid and, I would see these celebrities and movie stars and Hollywood actors and then people like Bruce Lee, people like Jackie Chan, Jet Li, you know, Tony Jaw, so to speak. And and I was like, God, that would be so cool to like be able to take my craft and my skill and apply it, you know, in front of a camera for 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 a global audience, for a domestic audience, whatever you have it. So so, so to, to, to this day, I always call it the fantasy. I'm living my fantasy out, you know, and, and to even add more, add, add, to add more, 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 um, I guess, just overall impact to, to, to the fantasy. Um, I just completed season one of, of HBO Cinemax's Warrior, um, which premiered this past April in the U.S. and we finaled this past June. And currently it's being shown in the UK, Australia, South Africa, Asia on HBO one. And it's just captivating a global audience at this point. And, and the irony there is for those of, for those of you guys that aren't familiar with the show warrior, the original treatment of warrior was written and envisioned and created by Bruce Lee back in the late sixties, early seventies. Um, and as you kind of mentioned with Kung Fu, you know, it was Bruce Lee's idea to create a martial arts Western back in the day. But unfortunately, due to the times of the late 60s and early 70s before he passed, you know, it's been documented, you know, in interviews and just in other in other um, articles that, you know, Hollywood was not ready for an Asian leading man, you know, back during that time when Bruce was alive. So come 50 something years later. You know, Shannon Lee brings it to Justin Lin. Justin Lin brings it to HBO. HBO brings it to Cinemax. Cinemax brings in Danielle Woodrow and Jonathan Tropper. And we completely fulfill the original vision and dream of the martial arts legend Bruce Lee in 2019. Um, So that's where I am currently. To sum it up in a nutshell, without taking three hours to say that in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, and I've been fortunate enough to to watch the show. You know, I just finished up with episode ten not too long ago, and mm-hmm. it's, it's a phenomenal show. You know, and, and I've Thank long you. been an advocate for martial arts as television, as movies. You can go back before Into the Badlands was was released. I was mm-hmm. on this show. Yeah preemptively yelling at martial artists to not critique the fight scenes too loudly, to stand behind something, to allow us to have shows that we could look at and say, Hey, this is a thing that we do. This is, this is an expression of something that we're all passionate about instead Mm -hmm. of kind of going the cliche route and, you know, everybody trashing it and and leaving the, the most obvious demographic tuning out. And, totally. You know, totally. We we got a few seasons into the Badlands, but there's something there's something really different about the way the martial arts is portrayed in Warrior, and it's it's I don't I don't know that I can fully articulate it, and I'm I'm wondering if if maybe you know what I'm talking about. If you because I'm I'm yes yes I I, I, what, I, I why is it all, different? I guess well, that's the first, my question for you. Yeah, thank you so much for 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 tuning into our show and and for watching it and for supporting it. I appreciate that tremendously. Um, and, and you're completely correct. Um, it's hard to articulate 
the style of martial arts in warrior. Um, just because it's so just, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to just, you know, brag a little bit because I'm so proud of our choreography. Um, our stunt coordinator, Brett Chan was, was a gift given to us. Um, but yeah, it's next level. And I think, you know, it's never been done before, you know, especially in a television series. Um, and so to sum that up, uh, I, I think, you know, number one, there were so many weird factors that came into play with warrior first being the fact that, and I'm not talking weird as a negative or positive, just weird and maybe coincidental and very in, in a, in an eerie way, very uh, meant to be. And, you know, like I said, you know, this was Bruce Lee's baby, basically, you know, and, and then so many years later, I was able to be a part of, of, of fulfilling his dream. So it's like, where do you even start on? Like, when you think of, you're going to do, you're going to do the legend show, the iconic martial artist in, you know, the history of the world, the fighting better be legit. It better be, you know, it better be what he wanted it to be, let's say. But in, in thinking of that, I think it's very unique because had this been done in, in you know, in the, in the early 70s, mid 70s, even late 70s, you know, that was a time in which the on-camera martial arts fighting and, and choreography was completely different than it was, than it is today. Um, you know, tr <laughs> the, the, the traditional kind of, you know, standoff where one guy throws some kicks, the other guy throws some kicks. I mean, the perfect example is like Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris, you know? They do their little warm up. Yeah. Um, they do their circle and then they engage. And, you know, at the time, I'm not discrediting or taking anything away from those two legends right there. I mean, that, that was the way to do it. And that was epic. And it kept, you know, and it just kept us all engaged in the scene, you know, but I think on, on another positive level, the evolution of the martial arts, you know, with the MMA and the UFC gaining such popularity in the last decade, you know, I just think that the on-camera fighting has become so mixed overall. You know, the fans want to see something that they believe, obviously, you know, and, and, and the truth of the matter is, I think now we are finally capturing what true fighting, what true spontaneous self-defense is all about. You know, because at the end of the day, martial arts is about a lot of different aspects of life and living and, and discipline, but it's, you know, obviously based on self-defense. You know, so in a lot of these films and TV shows in the past, to me, it never looked like self-defense. It looked like these guys knew they were going to fight. They knew they were going to throw down right now. And they knew they were going to throw this move. And this guy was going to throw this move. And this guy was going to win. You know, to me, it was never like, oh, wow, this guy had no idea he was going to be put in a situation and have to literally defend himself or his loved ones. And this is what he did to survive. You know, at the same time, we're doing it for camera. So we have to keep it clean, you know, and, and, and the reality is, and the unfortunate reality is, is a lot of times in real life, self-defense is not clean. You know, when, when you're put into a certain situation, you know, in the real world on the street, when you least expect it, it's not going to be a clean fight. It's going to be a survival mode, you know, in which things get messy, you know? And so how do you bring that organic realness, messiness to a fight? that demonstrates true martial arts skill, but at the same time, make it viewable and seeable by an, by an audience, you know, and that's the trick today. How do you combine all these, all these aspects and then all these newer demands and higher, you know, levels of the bar that's been raised by other people and other shows and other martial arts so that the fans and the viewers honestly believe it, not only believe it, but then are engaged with it, you know? So, I mean, that is just overwhelming, just telling you about that now, let alone, okay, let's go do Warrior and make sure we meet all of these quote-unquote fighting requirements, you know? Um, I, I, I think, you know, in the very first conversation I had with our stunt coordinator, Brett Chan, was, I mean, I, we were joking, I saw him recently, and we were joking about it, and I said, the first thing he came to me was like, what do you think about this style for Bolo? What do you think about that style? And I said, what do you think? He's like, well, what do you think? And I was like, well, I'm good. What do you think? And we just kept going back and forth because, you know, we wanted to stay so true to the original treatment, which obviously it was a Kung Fu based Chinese style of martial arts, let alone Bruce Lee's own Jeet Kune Do style and Wing Chun kind of remix together. But how do we keep the trueness of, 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 of the Chinese martial arts with 
the time period, which for those of you who aren't familiar with Warrior, it's set in 1878 San Francisco Chinatown. So number one, you have to incorporate the fact that, you know, we are, it is a Bruce Lee story. So we are going to stay true to him. It is a period piece. So we have to stay true to the fighting of that period. But then also we're filming it in 2000. We started in 2017, finished in 2018, season one. You know, so you combine old world, new world, new school, old school, all this crazy stuff. And and I think the only way we were able to achieve it was that we just were so specific um, with each character's fighting style. You know, I, I've, I've talked about this in other, in other interviews is that everything of Warrior was so detailed and so stylized. I mean, from, you know, all of the, our leads as hairstyles to, to the, what we wore. Again, those of you guys who have watched the show, you guys know already know there's a Hop Wei Tong, which is where Bolo, my character, belongs to. And there's the rival Tong, which is the Long Z. Tong meaning gang. It's basically about these, these two under, underground Tongs, so to speak, in Chinatown that are warring with each other um, throughout season one, you know, amidst all the political and social and demographic stuff that's going on on the surface, you know, with the British, the IRS, the Confederates and and all that other stuff that was happening in the late 19th 19th century. So, you know, my point is we just didn't throw on a jacket. My jacket was specific. My hatchet that I used was specific. It was different than other characters' weapons. It was different. I wear all black where in our Tong, everyone wears a white shirt. So with all these details and even with our language, the martial arts was definitely under a microscope the whole time. And, and with Bolo's character, you know, just because the character is actually based on, on, on the legendary martial artist Bolo Young, who's known in, from Enter the Dragon and also with Jean-Claude Van Damme in Bloodsport as Chung Lee. You know, he, he was a, a Chinese martial artist that, you know, had a, had a foundation in Gong Fu. And, and, and we decided that we were going to honor him and attribute him and, and keep it within the Hungar Gong Fu style for him, you know, which for those of you who aren't familiar with it, you know, the overall principle is basically minimum movement with maximum impact. And that's basically what the Bolo character was about, you know, where our lead Assam played by Andrew Koji, you know, who is the character who Bruce would have played had they made this back in the seventies, you know, he was, he, he's your, he has Gong Fu skills, he has Jeet Kune Do skills, he has Wing Chun skills, and he's stylized martial arts-wise in a totally different way than Bolo is. You know, so once we got specific enough to dial it in that, okay, this character's doing this style of martial arts, this character's doing this style, you know, then we had to then take it to the choreography. You know, meaning that now that we're loaded, so to speak, in these different martial arts and we know where we're going and we know our backstory, we know our foundation, how do these two or these three or four different styles of martial arts come together for a fight scene, for a brawl, for, 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 for any of the fights that we did in season one and, and make it real? You know, and that's where it really, to me, was like a, 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 a kumite, like all styles, all kind of colors, all fighters, you know, tournament. You know, because when we, depending on who I had to fight, it was like, okay, this guy is this style, I'm this style. So he would throw this and I would counter with this, or I would lead with this and he would follow with that. And so, I mean, that's where, you know, the stunt department and our fight choreographers get all the credit because, you know, we're basically doing what they want. You know, of course, they're very open to us and, 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 and always want our input. Um, you know, funny side story is during, I think, episode two, uh, at the beginning of it, we have this, you know, the hop, the hop way tongue we engage. There's an opium trade and a molasses trade that's kind of going on. It was kind of like the, um, the underground drug trafficking trade of the time, let's say. And episode two opens with the hop way, my tongue, basically paying off the port officials to intercept an opium import that the Long Z, our rival tongs, are picking up. And, you know, the, the, this fight scene was just supposed to be an opening scene uh, before the teaser, before the credits. And um, it turned into this whole other thing because, you know, literally in the description, I'm supposed to cut off this guy's arm. I'm supposed to split this guy's head open with an axe. 
And I'm supposed to slice this other guy with an ax as well. And that's like my main three kind of kills, so to speak. Well, prior to the, prior to the day, I speak with our showrunner, Jonathan Tropper and our director uh, for that episode, Lonnie Parrish there. And he, they were like, okay, we need, we want to, we want to put a little flash in Bolo. We want the audience, we want the viewers to see that Bolo is not just this um, kind of not, I wouldn't want to say stiff, but just this certain like rugged, stiff martial artist. Like we want to show that he has flair. He has a certain amount of ability to kick. He's not just going to grab you and, and knock you out, so to speak, or he's not just going to grab you and knee you and break all your ribs. Like we want to show that he has a finesse side of him as well. So after, you know, all these months of prepping in, in the Hungar Gong Fu style, then all of a sudden they're like, you know, they, they knew I had a Taekwondo background. So then they asked me, they're like, you know what, for the opening sequence, can you do like a, like a spin wheel or a jump spin kick? Or, so I'm like, dude, you know, and I told him, I was like, dude, that is so Taekwondo. That is so not Gong Fu. And they're like, yeah, but we need it. And so right there was a perfect example where I laughed because there was people on the crew that were martial artists. And they literally came up to me, like one of the camera assistants came up to me, um, who didn't have any idea of this backstory. He was like, hey, you're based in Taekwondo, aren't you? And I started laughing. I said, why? He's like, I saw your footwork and your chamber step before you did your spin wheel kick. And I, it, it, it read 100% Taekwondo style. So I started laughing because I was like, you're exactly right. And so, you know, I tell this story because no matter how, how much you try to stick to the original script, to the original form, and, 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 and stay true to this style, you just can't help but venture off because, you know, different, different situations call for different things, you know, and, and that's why I emphasize that there would be no way we could have gotten to where we went on the show fight-wise if we did not start off as specific and as true to our certain styles of fighting because, you know, things happen during filming um things get in the way you have to adjust um and and what's cool is that you know instinct kicks in and even though we've been we've been repping and and you know you know choreographing a fight where i counter a certain way after a certain move let's say there were times when my instinct kicked in and and i did something different and they loved that you know so we used that and that may have not been a traditional kung fu move let's say but it worked for the shot and it was believable and it was real. So it, it's, I mean, that's, that's my best way to articulate the fighting style and incorporating all these things. Cause like I said, you had to incorporate facts from the original treatment. You had to stay true to those forms. You also have to adjust because of the period of the 1880s and 1870s, but you also are appealing to a 2019, 2020 millennial generation audience. You know, so what might have been a completely accurate and traditional uh, back back in the 1800s may be completely boring and unrealistic and not and you know un- not believable in the present day. So that's why I think at the end of the day, when the fans and, and everyone that supported our show watches these fights and, and are you know blown away by, we've never seen anything like this. Like it's crazy. You know, it's so real. It's so bloody. It's so gory. I mean, mission accomplished. You know. And, 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 and like I say, when, when it looks easy and it looks great, that means it's extremely difficult to do. And, and, and I give all the credit to our stunt department and our stunt team. Hmm. Nice. And yeah, I, I have to agree that the fight scenes that we're talking about, they are next level. They are beyond what I'm used to seeing in, certainly in, in anything on TV and similar to the level that we're starting to see come through in some of the movies, a lot of people will look at something like the raid or John wick and talk about the, the violence, the intensity and some mm-hmm. of the, the perceived reality. Cause let's face it. Very few of us have ever been in an exchange similar to anything that we would see in those movies or, or in warrior. <laughs> so, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's hard to speak from personal experience, but you know, when we talk speculatively, this seems a little more realistic to us. And I, yeah. I have to, I have to wonder, the way you're describing this process is different than I've heard. You know, we've had some other folks on the show who have participated in, in movies and TV shows and been part of choreography. But you're talking about it in what sounds to be a, a much more collaborative method. 
than mm-hmm. is typical, at least my understanding of what's typical in Hollywood. Is that true? I mean, yes. And, and that actually goes beyond the, the fighting. And what I mean by that is, you know, this was probably the largest cast that I had been a part of. I think we had, I think, 13 or 14 leads because there's just so many stories and so many characters throughout, you know, the, the, the season one of Warrior that we have to get to, basically, you know, and, and that was intimidating to, to, to be flown out to Cape Town, South Africa, where we filmed, where we filmed Warrior, uh, to a foreign country, to a foreign city, and to then have to bond and work with 13, 14 strangers that we've never worked with. I've never worked with anyone on the show before. And so to me, it was exciting um, because I was already a fan of, of people like Hoon Lee from his show Banshee, which was obviously another Jonathan Tropper show on Cinemax. Um, I was obviously a fan of Joe Taslim, who everyone knows him from The Raid. Um, and, and, and it was just I was just really excited the opportunity to work with people like those two individuals at the same time, you know, I, I hope we can come together and, and mesh as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a unit to, to fulfill the dream of, of Bruce Lee, you know, and that was always the overall pressure. Um, and, and to, to sum it up, I mean, it was a family. I, I give all the credit to the casting and to Justin Lin and to Jonathan Tropper and Danielle Woodrow and Shannon Lee, because they brought together, 13, 14 strangers from around the world, literally. Um, just to give you some perspective on that, I am the only actor on the show that's based and from Los Angeles. I mean, that was weird in itself. That's, you know, just yeah. because everything, yeah. everything gets cast out of L.A. Um, I'm, I'm one of those weird actors that's actually born and raised in L.A. and lives in L.A. and <laughs> now works in L.A., you know? And, and to be paired up with, you know, Diane and Olivia, our female leads, are from Vancouver. Uh, Hoon, Perry, and Henry are all from the East Coast. We have Joe from Indonesia, Jason Tobin from Hong Kong, and we have Kieran Drew and Dean Jagger and Andrew Koji out of the UK and Langley Kirkwood out of South Africa. I mean, they're, they're, I'm missing some Joanna Vanderhams from the UK. Like, it was such a global casting that when we finally met each other and started working, it was so, there was so much unity and so much love. And it became, a, I mean, people brought their families out there. You know, pe- we always have to move our lives wherever we go, especially if we we're going to be on a show like this halfway around the world. We just, we can't commute, so to speak. So it was very cool because we got to meet everyone's family. Uh, it is the tightest cast I've ever been a part of. And I think that love for each other kind of challenged challenge each one of us every day, meaning that we got up for work and we knew that everyone else was giving 150% that we would have to give just as much, you know, and then that, that kind of fed into the choreography because we already had this kind of offset bonding going on, so to speak. And, and once we got to work where we all love to work and what, you know, we love what we do for, for a living it just accelerated that bond even more, you know, the trust, um, the perseverance and just the commitment to not only the show, but to each other, you know? And so to me, I knew it. I was, I used to tell like my castmates, I was like, you know what? The fact that we do get along so well on this show and the fact that we do literally, I mean, we, we sincerely are friends will definitely pay off, you know, especially with the fighting and stuff. You know, so I think that that was one of the most realistic things that 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 was that that came about while we were shooting is that, you know what? I trust you. You trust me. And I actually like you and I you like me and we're going to go and we're going to create this epic fight scene for the world to see, you know, so it was very open book. Uh, Brett Chan, Brett Chan and our stunt department really did an excellent job of just mixing our styles asking us what we felt most comfortable with. And, you know, at the end of the day, it was about delivering a realistic fight between two people, three people, nine people at one point, you know, that not only looked like a, like, like a dance, but like an unchoreographed, like an unchoreographed dance, you know, because again, the biggest thing that we had to do is make it look like we didn't plan to, re- to do these fights, that they happened 
on the on the day at that specific moment, you know, and this is how you react and handle it. So again, when I hear the feedback from the fans and everyone, it, it, it blows my mind because, you know, people ask me like, wow, you guys look like you really, you really got along. I'm like, no, like we get along to this day. You know, we, 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 we meet up wherever we are in the world. We, you know, we're always on, on, on chat rooms and, and on conference calls. And now obviously with all this technology on, on video chat room calls, you know, and, and it's just such a cool, cool situation to be in. You know, because we actually kind of forgot about the show because we were so engaged with everyone's real lives and everyone's well-being that work was work. And and, and we got along so well on the personal level that I just think it was just a residual effect. You know, when people watch a show that they see the love between the characters, they see the hate, you know, but behind that hate is love, you know, and behind those fights. Our, 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 our blood, sweat, and tears that we, that we all like poured out for each other, you know, just because we felt that we had to, because we didn't want to, you know, let down, you know, your fellow castmates, so to speak. Mm. So I'm glad, I'm glad that came through. Definitely. Yeah, it certainly does. You know, and you know, one of the things that we joke about on this show that one of these things that I, you know, I'm not taking credit for this. I've, I've heard this for decades, this idea that as martial artists, we befriend people not despite the fact that they punch us in the face but because you know sometimes our best friends are the ones who will push us the furthest and mm-hmm. help us grow the most as martial artists and it sounds like you know that happened even broader you know beyond the fight scenes but the the entire experience of being part of this yeah. crew. yes totally i mean that's so accurate again um i mean you know traditionally my 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 sport that I, I pursued besides martial arts was football. And, you know, some of the guys that, you know, I started playing Pop Warner full contact football at the age of eight years old. And some of my closest friends to this day who excelled in football as well. And we all went and played college football at the division one level. And some of us even, you know, I didn't, but a lot of my good friends and, and longtime teammates were able to go to the NFL. Those bonds were created when we were eight years old crying in full gear in a hundred degree weather bear crawling on you know dirt and grass mixed together you know yeah. and, and and it just created this bond that lasted a lifetime and, and it's so weird because you know like i said it was the first time we met you know all of us the cast in cape town and and we only had a certain amount of time to to get to know each other and to start doing you know to start filming and start, you know, putting this, putting this legend's vision in, into kinetic energy and movements and, and bring it to life. And, and it just shows you that, yeah, you know what, there was a bond because we were training every day and, and yeah, we were sweating, we were getting hit, you know, obviously unintentionally, <laughs> but you know, there, there was, there were injuries, there, there, were, there were recoveries and, and it really allowed us to grow off camera you know, and, and I think, you, you know, overall, you know, especially in the filming industry and especially in the action world of Hollywood, you know, like I, I, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but I, I believe I truly bonded with Andrew Koji um, in preparation for our, our finale fight, you know, not to give any spoilers out there um, to those who haven't watched it, but, you know, Andrew Koji plays awesome and I, we have a fight, I think in episode seven, and, you know, we had started training for that fight just because it's the longest fight in my career I've ever had to do, let alone it's the longest edited fight that I've been a part of. Uh, again, for those people outside the business, you know, you can literally film one fight scene for, for a week or weeks. And that, and that fight ends up getting edited down to less than a minute, maybe, you know, or a minute, or a minute and a half, 90 seconds, you know, but. I believe this fight was almost edited to four minutes, which in reality is a lifetime to shoot. And, you know, we, we encountered a lot of adversity, you know, not, not, not with each other, so to speak, but with our environment, with, you know, just stuff that happens on the day, you know, like we had been, this one day we had been filming for, I think at least five hours, this one sequence, just, you know, it's hot, like we're dripping, we're changing shirts because we have to keep the continuity, you know, we're just sweating through our clothes. And they let us know 
five hours later that we may have to do it all again because a light in the background ended up turning off three hours into the fight. And that continuity wise, they weren't, they didn't know if they could put it back in or how, but they literally told us, you know what, we have to stop. We have to go back and redo that. And I remember, you know, I, luckily for me, I've just been in a lot of situations. So to me, this is just part of the game. But, you know, a- Andrew, Andrew being, you know, this is I, his first show, you know, and he did a phenomenal job as, as our lead, you know, leading us, you know, from episode one to episode 10. And, you know, I just looked at him. I said, hey, man, this, this is this is how this is reality. You know, I said, so just, you know, put your head down and let's get back to work and let's just keep going, you know, because we're already warmed up. So let's just keep doing what we've just been doing and we'll get the shot and we'll move on. And I think times like that, you know, when you're tired and, and you know, you're exhausted and you're past the mid season, you know, Mark and, you know, it, 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 every, there's a lot of other factors that start to wear on you. And I think just like when I was playing football at the age of eight, you know, jogging a mile as an eight year old in full pads with a helmet, you know, side note, same helmet I wore in college. I was wearing it age of eight because I had a huge head you know like <laughs> that 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 mile jog no matter how slow you do it seems like an eternity you know and just like the five hours of us putting in work on this one day for this one sequence that we that we had to do again seemed like an eternity I mean those are the moments that you grow as I think individuals and also you grow with the people you're you're you know you're in the trenches with so to speak you know, and that's exactly what happened with me and Andrew. And, and, and those are the moments that I cherish. You know, it's easy to come to work the first day, the first week, the first episode, you know, and have good energy and be positive and, and, and just, you know, overall healthy and mentally, physically, emotionally, everything. You know, I always say, I want to know how you're going to be, you know, the last day of a 10 episode season, five months later, banged up, bruised up, you know injured this, injured that, like that's when you're going to see someone's true colors and that's when you're going to grow as a person or, you know, as, as teammates, you know? And so to me, it, it, it was, it, it was just such a, it was such a just rewarding experience because not only, you know, I always say, we're, I'm always going to deliver on camera for you, no matter who I work with. That's, that's my, that's my, you know, assurance to the people that hire me. You know, but what I never count on are the relationships and the friendships that come about, you know, during these, during these times, you know, and, and, and to just walk away with one really good friend, you know, is always a bonus, let alone I walked away with 13, 14 friends, you know, that I can sincerely call my friends, you know, mm-hmm. and, 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 and I, and I think that is the special, that's, that's the gift, and, you know, and I attribute that again to Bruce. And I always say Bruce Lee is the gift that keeps on giving. And to this day, you know, right now on the, you know, on, on the show with you right now, he continues to give to me and I am forever, you know, indebted to this man and his family, you know, because like, you know, you're bringing up all these amazing points that again, reinforce the fact that we were brought together by this, I believe this higher being, you know, I don't want to say it's Bruce Lee, you know, overlooking us, but I really believe he's been watching over all of us our whole lives because there's no way that a kid like me back in the day is, you know, thinking that one someday I'm going to, I'm going to help Bruce Lee's legacy out. You know what I mean? Like someday I'm going to get that opportunity. Like there's no way. So it's just, it's it's, it's truly remarkable. Super cool. Now, one of the things that I find interesting about a show like this, when you, when you look at martial arts as it's been portrayed in cinema, whether it's small screen or big screen, you seem to have two categories of people. You have actors who are accepted for their acting skill, and then they learn some martial arts, and they tend to get pushed back or at least disparaged because their martial arts skills aren't quite there. And then you've got the exact opposite. You've got people who are hired into the industry because their martial arts are top-notch, but they're acting, you know, eh, maybe not quite so good. Uh Uh-huh. But then you get the rare person who has both, but they still tend to be treated as one or the other. I mean, there are a a significant number of actors in Hollywood who have real martial arts skill, but most people would never know it. And then you've got 
martial artists who've been on camera who can really act, but they never get the roles to showcase their acting skill. Mm -hmm. With Warrior, it seems like we ended up with a number of people who have both. How did that happen? I think you need to bring Justin Lin, Shannon Lee, Jonathan Tropper, and Danielle Woodrow on your show and ask them that question because that all that what you just asked is attributed to, to, I mean, I saw one of Justin's interviews and he said, literally we had to search the globe, you know, because you're exactly right. You actors, stunt, stunt men, stunt women, martial artists. When you enter Hollywood, you, you get typecasted real fast, you know, and, 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 and a personal story of mine is that, you know, having all these, I would say, physical tools in my, you know, in my back pocket, you know, whether it be the martial arts or, or the athletics with the football, baseball, basketball, you know, and track background that I had throughout high school and college, you know, or even the academic background, you know, what I, what I always told myself is I'm going to always carry all these tools in my pocket for whatever character I need to showcase, you know, a little bit of here or a little bit of there, or sprinkle these little things there, you know, because, you know, I, I was able to not only, you know, graduate from college, but finish law school and get my JD and get my MBA as well and actually work a little bit in the corporate sector, you know, but I was, I was raised in a medical family. My dad is an orthopedist. And so, you know, as the eldest in my family, I've just kind of taken notes you know, my whole, my whole life on all these different areas of, 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 of living, whether it's medical, academic, uh, athletic, you know, and, and the one thing I always say at the end of the day is I just got to be an athlete. You know, when I say that it's, it, it means you just have to be flexible enough and limber enough to multitask. You know, you need to be able to walk and talk. You need to be able to kick and talk. You need to be able to not move and talk. You know what I mean? And, 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 and in a weird way, like I said, you know, I'm living my fantasy out as, 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 an, as an actor in Hollywood because I, I never thought I, was, I would be able to do this as a job, let alone a career. And so what I realized once I got into this business is that, you know what, all these different aspects of my upbringing, which is extremely diverse and very just random at times, I realized it was all preparation for me to enter this business as a quote-unquote actor. You know, and, and that's what my team and I have have. have strive to do you know in my career is you know i'm an actor first with a lot of different tools you know and and again i can't speak for everyone else on the cast but i believe maybe there's a lot of similarities with that mentality uh perfect example is jason tobin who plays young june um i've known jason as the actor he's been in you know one of justin Lin's first films better luck tomorrow and he's been in you know one of the fast and furious um films as well and, and, and I've always known Jason Tobin as the actor, you know, and then come to find out he has a martial arts training background. He has a foundation in it. And it was very obvious once we started doing fight choreography, you know, cause you know, I, I've worked with a lot of quote unquote athletes who are not martial artists and, you know, they, they can pick up certain moves and certain, you know, choreography just because they're in tune with their biomechanical self, let's say. But with Jason, it was very evident right away that I was like, no, this guy definitely has some training. And then I found out, he's like, yeah, he's like, I've been, tra I've, I've, I've had training in martial arts my whole life. I just never been called to use it in front of the camera. So this is the first time I get to use it. And I was like, see, that's remarkable to me because this is another fellow actor of mine and a close friend of mine now that I had no idea he, he had this skill. And, and I think I've been the same way to other people. You know, there's certain people that know me as Rich Ting, the athlete, Rich Ting, the football player, Rich Ting, the martial artist, you know, and, and um, I just feel a lot of us are in that same boat where, you know, if I show up on another job and I have to be, uh, you know, it's a procedural deal and I have to be a lawyer, people are like, oh my God, like you, you, you. You, you can do these things that real lawyer, whatever that means, culture wise, mannerism, behavior. It's like, I know I would tell them, like, yeah, I've been in a courtroom. You know, I've dealt with true legal cases. I've dealt with court deadlines. I've dealt with working at a huge firm. You know, I know what that real vibe is. You know, that's something else that's very similar to martial arts where you may have no idea this certain individual has that background. 
you know, and then all of a sudden he gets called to do a part and he's able to bring that tool to the forefront and perform, you know, and, and, and the craziest thing about all this, you know, is what you said, you know, there's actors, there's martial artists, and, you know, everyone gets labeled, but the baddest martial artist on our warrior team is Jonathan Tropper, our showrunner. He is the most unassuming, nicest, just, just, you wouldn't even think anything like he's just a truly nice guy, ex- extremely intelligent, extremely giving. Um, he's the captain of our show. And then you find out that he's a black belt and it just blows your mind because he starts doing these movements you would never anticipate him doing. And it is a hundred percent legit. You know what I mean? So I think you're right. People get t- typecasted all the time. You know, at the same time, you know, you would never think our showrunner is, is the deadliest dude on set when you got people like Joe Taslim walking around, you know? So I think, you know, all the credit again, you know, and I have to give credit, I have to give credit to our stunt team. I have to give credit to our casting and to our producers and to our showrunners because they found us, you know, it's, 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 you can, you can, you're right. You can go out and get the actor and train that actor, but is it going to be believable in, in a fighting situation? You can go out and get, you know, the stunt guy or the stunt girl and, 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 and help them with their line lines or their quote unquote acting, but it may not be the same. You know, I always tell people like there's such a difference and separation between martial artists in the real world and then bringing that realness to camera. You know, I always say you have to have a foundation obviously, but then you almost have to relearn the art so that it's believable and it's readable on camera. You know, because certain times, you know, just simple things like the way you chamber or the way you would throw a punch in real life doesn't read realistic on camera. You have to break form. You have to break technique on camera to sell a hit. You know, so some of the best martial artists in the world, you know, some of the best dem- demonstration guys and demo teams and, and technical guys can technically make some of the worst martial artists on camera just because it's a different technique. You know, so you throw that. So not only did you have to find the actor that can act, but you have to find the actor who can also is is also a martial artist, but more importantly, can sell the martial arts on camera. And then you got to find the the third element, which is someone who's done enough where they're not only a martial arts based individual that's an actor, but has done enough fighting on camera to understand the art of fighting on camera. You know. And so that's why in a weird way, the cast of warrior and, 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 and I'm not trying to put us up on a pedestal or anything, but I'm just trying to be as honest as I can. It is definitely an elite special group of talented actors, you know, and I say talented because under that, under that umbrella of talent comes acting, martial arts, athleticism, you know, vulnerability, uh, flexibility, you know, there's all these different requirements adjustability for example you know and somehow some way they found us and when we came together it was magic and 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 again I, i'm loving your questions and your and your statements because they're so specific and and they're so they're so right on you know you, everything you're bringing up is definitely completely right on cool well i'm glad i'm getting it right <laughs> yeah <laughs> So we've talked about, you know, the now you gave us a little bit of the past. Let's let's look forward. What's going on for the future for you? You know, what are you looking forward to? What are your goals? Talk to us about that. Yeah, well, first off, I just came back from my first ever Comic Con, which was craziness. Um, such a pleasant trip and just wow, the fans. I can't say enough about the fans. Um, unfortunately, Warrior was not able to be present this year, but hopefully next year. But I actually went because my next show, um, I'm part of the Amazon Prime family now. And I, um, I successfully completed the final and fourth season of Amazon's The Man in the High Castle uh, following our filming of Warrior Season 1 last year. So we just made an announcement at Comic-Con 2019 in San Diego that The Man in the High Castle on Amazon Prime, the fourth and final season of the show, will be premiering on November 15th this fall. So I'm so excited. We were able to tease a lot of different scenes 
uh, for the fans. We had a sold out panel. Um, they had to shut the doors. It, it was just an overwhelming turnout at Comic Con for, for the man in the high castle. And, and for it to be our finale season and for just me having the opportunity to be a part of this family um, was, just, was just another gift of mine last year. And uh, that's going to be dropping November 15th, like I said. And um, yeah, it just, we're just, uh, we're in a lot of meetings. And, and actually, as soon as we, we wrap this, this podcast up, I, I got to jump to another one because uh, there's a lot of stuff cooking and I can't talk about it right now. So I don't want to jinx it, <laughs> but um, I'll say this. My stunt coordinator, Brett Chan told me we had a, we had a quick conversation back last year in Cape town. And I, it was the last day of my final fight scene for season one. And, and the joke was, I told him, and I was being honest, I said, man, I'm so glad we're finishing now because I felt like I had a preseason, a season, and a postseason all in one season, you know, and, and I need to recover and I'm banged up and, I'm, and I need to take a breath, basically. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, not having to stretch and, and sweat so much on the next one. And he laughed and said, you know what? When the world sees you as Bolo on Warrior, they are going to start calling for more Bolo and more Warrior-ish type of skill and, 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 and projects. And I just started laughing because I was like, you know what? I actually didn't even think about that. You know, to me, Warrior Season 1 was one and done, and I get to move on to the next one. And, and he, he quickly reminded me that you better get ready because once – you know, the world, let alone Hollywood, sees what you did with this character and the way you move and, 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 and the type of fighting you did. Just be ready to, to continue that genre, so to speak. And I'm completely open to that. And so without giving anything away, we're taking a lot of meetings. And like I said, I want to jinx it, but um, it's going in that direction right now. And it's very, very uh, positive, And I'm excited to see uh, what, uh, what I can announce in the upcoming months so stay tuned (laughs) awesome awesome keep us surprised and we'll we'll make sure that the audience knows what's going on with you if you want to follow you social media websites that kind of thing where where can they stay stay yes i'm on all facebook twitter instagram um rich ting world is the name all right cool and we'll we'll drop those links in the social um sorry in the show notes whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for anybody that might be new to the show this has been a blast, ton of fun. Thanks for giving us the behind the scenes. Thanks for letting us what's going on, you know, with you. It's been, it's, it's, been a, it's been a great story. I mean, look at you, you've, you've, you know, to go that full circle. I mean, there's something really poetic in that imagery of you as a four-year-old to, to now and helping bring Bruce Lee's vision to the rest of us. I mean, that's, that's powerful. Yeah, it's- it's nuts to me. I mean, I'm not someone that's like sits back and goes, yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm like, no, like it's still, um, I don't know if there's a deniability that's still present with me, you know, but you know, the fact I'm such good friends with Shannon Lee and, and the Lee family, I mean, that's even, that's crazy to me. You know what I mean? Because, you know, she's taking me in as family from the beginning of this show and she continues to keep that relationship going. And, keep me included with all the events and you know you know it's it's just it's been surreal and i I can't put it in words because uh you know to me i'm i'm rich you know that's it you know i'm rich you know the actor you know always you know grinding and training and always prepping but like i I, when people go oh my gosh like i loved you and warrior like uh, you know you made bruce lee so proud it's just it's very it's very weird to to hear that because I I think it's very rare and very unique to be able to have an idol as a kid, as a four-year-old kid. That's the one that influences you philosophy-wise, living-wise, um, physical, physically-wise, like every in every part of life. You know, like Bruce had so, had, he just had so many lessons, so much knowledge that he gave the world, you know outside of martial arts and, and it's all affected me and impacted me throughout my entire life and come full circle. Like you said, I mean, who gets to repay their idol who is no longer, you know, present in this world by, by fulfilling a vision and, and the treatment he did way before I was born. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's crazy. And so, I mean, we talk about it as a cast all the time. 
you know, and like I, like at the end of the day, I always conclude, you know, Bruce Lee is the gift that keeps on giving, you know, and as long as I can impact or, or affect some other kid out there who is in a similar situation as me. And, you know, maybe I can just inspire just one person. Then again, it's the gift that keeps on giving because that kid's going to grow up to give back as well. You know? So it's just, ah, uh, it's still, I'm still, people still need to pinch me, you know, literally. I believe it. Totally get it. We always ask our guests to send us out in uh same way what mm -hmm. parting words what wisdom you know what bit would you offer up to the people listening today i would say people always say you know the cliche thing is if you work hard and you believe in something it'll happen you know that you know life is limitless my remix version on that is in order to succeed and to fulfill and reach your dreams and goals. And in my case, my fantasy, you know, which was being a Hollywood actor. And you know, obviously we're talking about fulfilling the, the legacy of Bruce Lee, you know, via warrior and playing the character of Bolo. I always believe that, you know what? Hard work alone may not get it, but hard work, perseverance and commitment is going to help you get a little bit more luck on your side. So with a combination of luck and determination and hard work, you can fulfill your dream because a lot of people think it's just going to happen overnight. And sometimes it does happen overnight, but it happened overnight because of what you put into it and what you've dedicated yourself to up until that day before the other night. And then you get a little bit of luck and then your dream comes true. So that, that's my remix on that one. I always enjoy talking to people who've taken the martial arts, something that they love, and turn it into, let's say, a non-traditional martial arts career. We have a lot of people on the show who teach for a living, and that's great, and we need that. But I love to see that being a martial artist doesn't necessarily mean that your job as a martial artist is to be a martial arts instructor. And here we have Mr. Ting talking about how martial arts not only changed his life, but it gave him a platform from which he can reach the world through all the different characters that he becomes. Thank you for coming on the show, sir. Thank you for everything that you shared. And I hope that we get to talk again. If you want to find the show notes, transcript, videos, photos, links, all the stuff that we talked about today, whistlekick, martialartsradio.com. It's the place to go. Sign up for the newsletter while you're over there. Maybe jump on a link over to whistlekick.com. Save yourself 15% with the code podcast15. And maybe check out some of the other things that we do while you're there. If you want to help us out, whether you make a purchase or not, feel free to share this episode. Leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Facebook, Google. Anything you can do to help would be greatly appreciated. Helps us grow. Helps us stay here, honestly. Our social media is at Whistlekick. All one word. W-H-I-S-T-L-E-K-I-C-K. -I -I Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. My personal email address, if you want to reach me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. I thank you for your time and all of your support. And until the next episode, train hard, smile, and have a great day.